<laughs> shielding the fauna of bottomless knowledge blossoming with the flora of legal excellence he is a museum our politics constitutionalism and history trumpeted in his books are corner pieces that spread over universities homes and libraries he is an incredible man, an incredible gem, as I told you. He used the spears of humor and wit and wisdom to battle dictatorship here in Uganda and spear racism in Britain. He is a legal mountain. Kanyihamba is a mountain bigger than Wenzori in legal circles. The hiking of which requires you years, not months. A fortress of judicial independence, thick like the impenetrable windy. The personification of consistence. 
His overflowing and ever flowing brilliance. His loyalty to rule of law parallel the permanence of the Amazon. He is the river Nile of legal scholarship, in whose rich basin we gladly dwell. His throbbing and gushing legal waters weight the Nile basin and the entire globe. fearless descent. And you cannot confiscate Kanyihamba's descent. is served on plates of humor seasoned with patriotism. And like Lord Denning, his dissenting judgments bleed ooze and envies honor and integrity. Just like his majority precedents are immortalized classrooms. He is he needs no coffee. He is an indefatigable volcano, or is lapped in against impunity, sending missiles with nuclear heads into territories of injustice. His intellectual magnum splashes hot against militarism. His Solomonic hate defies age. That is why, even today, we congregate Chorus hymns of this literary wonder called the evolution of constitutional law, public law, and governance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aaron. Another round of applause for that wonderful poem. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in your different capacities, um, of course, there are a number of leaders from uh, the different arms of the government present with us, both serving and retired. And uh, we should recognize the presence of our Deputy Speaker of Parliament, uh, the Right Honorable Jacob Olanya, who is our Chief Guest today. Thank you for coming. Um, should also recognize the presence of our former Prime Minister, former Secretary General of the NRM, the Right Honorable John Patrick Amamambawazi. It's been a while. Thank you for coming. We have um, justices of the Supreme Court, both serving and present. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for honoring the invitation. And different individuals in their different capacities, we appreciate the fact that you took time off uh, to come and join this celebration. Now, over the years, there's a name that has sounded in every sphere of our governance, in cabinet, in parliament, and finally in the Supreme Court of this great country before he went into retirement. His works, numbering 31, have become the benchmark for constitutionalism. And in law schools across the region, they are the templates upon which law students drink from the knowledge of the law. Ladies and gentlemen, it's about time we listened to the distinguished Supreme Court, retired Supreme Court Justice Professor George Kanyahamba. And because we are here to celebrate his work and dedication, I will request that all of us stand up and clap as he comes to speak to us. All right. Okay. I'll carry the microphone to Prof and speak from there. Ladies and gentlemen, we can, we can have our seats now and listen to Professor Kanyan. Uh, thank you very much. I will not take long time. I speak through my books, therefore I have already spoken. I very much... Let me start by saying somebody that an individual at one time approached me at the airport in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia 
And we got into a conversation. And he told me that the tragedy of Africa is that we are in the business of vilifying our best men and women during their lifetime. And when they are dead, we lionize and rhapsodize them. Today, I come here to rhapsodize and lionize a man who deserves to be celebrated, George Wilson Kanye Hamba. And the reason why I do so is because he has bestrode and continues to be tried the legal terrain not only in Uganda but in East Africa as they would have said in Greek of old or in Greece of old like the fabled Colossus that he has penned 31 books is no mean achievement and you Ugandans will remember that he served as a member of parliament and we can celebrate that you will remember that he served as a minister for commerce and we can celebrate that you will remember that he served as a minister for justice and the attorney general and we can celebrate that you will remember that he served as a member of the constituent assembly when you are making your constitution in 1995 and we can celebrate that you will remember that he served as one of the early judges of the east africa of the african court of human rights in banjul the gambia and we can celebrate that but we are not here to celebrate those there will be occasions for doing so today we are here to celebrate his great work which is evolution of constitutional law, public law, and government, his 31st book. And we can say in Latin, this is his magnum opus. His magnum opus because it is his greatest work. It is a culmination of the ideas that he has articulated elsewhere and what he does in this book is to give them a new shin and a new freshness at a time not, when not only Uganda is going through a very unique epoch of governance, but Africa is also going through such a unique epoch. But allow me a little historicization. When did I first meet Professor Dr. George Wilson Kanye Hamba. I remember so very vividly in 1981 as a student of constitutional law at the University of Nairobi. And I remember so very vividly my own teacher in constitutional law whom he knows very well. Hastings Wilfred Opinia Okotogendo, telling us that if there is any book that you must read on constitutional law, it is that written by the then Dr. George Kanye Hamba. If one were to be <laughs> melodramatic about it, it was prescribed to us as if it was some kind of Bible, some kind of Quran, some kind of Hindu Gita. And we read the book keenly. And of course, we appreciated the erudition with which the work was written and the celerity of the mind of the man who penned those issues. Even in those early days, when the meeting was only virtual, I saluted this giant of the law as a great man. But I was to meet Professor Kanye Hamba in flesh and blood in the year 2002 when I had the honor and privilege of serving as the Secretary General and the Chief Executive of Kenya's own constitution making process, the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission. We walked around the country and we took the paths 
of the Kenyan nation. The Ugandans had gone through a constitutional review exercise and those who are in the business of constitution making did acknowledge that the Ugandan constitution of 1995 was considered to be one of the best constitutions in the world. Whatever parameters they used, I do not know, but they said so, and I have no reason to contradict them. We looked at all areas. I remember then in matters of how you had the architecture of the legislature, and we thought that it was good. We looked at how you designed the executive, and we thought that it was good. We looked at how you designed political parties, and we thought that it was good. We looked at how you designed the judiciary, and we thought that it was good. But we were a little hesitant in dealing with the Kenyan judiciary without the involvement of legal luminaries. We therefore came out working jointly with the Law Society of Kenya and the judiciary itself to look for men and women who by dint of their experience and training could preside over an exercise of examining our judiciary and making prescriptions on how it ought to be restructured. And we fell upon the name of Professor Dr. George Wilson Kanyehamba. We assembled a team of individuals who then came to Kenya under the aegis of the Commonwealth. They sat down and they gave us a piece of work. And when you look at the architecture of the Kenyan judiciary today, it is out of the work that was done by Professor Dr. George Wilson Kanyehamba. It is therefore not hyperbolic for me to say that we are present here before a giant, a man who has contributed to law not only in Uganda but in Africa, a man who has had the advantage of crossing the borders of this country and sojourning in universities outside of this country, a man whom you know took time during difficult moments to become a teacher in the United Kingdom. A man who during his time, not only did he sit on the seats where academics do, but when this country was going through struggle, his contributions will be remembered. That is the man that I'm here to praise. That is the man that we are here to celebrate. That is the man that we are here to honor. That is the man that we are here to rhapsodize. That is the man that we are here to lift his hand. It is the great English poet William Shakespeare who said about greatness that some are born great, some have greatness thrust upon them, and some become great. This man has become great by dint of grit and hard work, and we are under obligation to celebrate him. You know, as a young man, I read about a great man, a great poet, writing about great poetry in the same manner that he has been celebrated through poetry. I read a poem written by the great Nigerian Wale Shoinka. And Shoinka said that a tiger does not go about shouting about his tigritude. A tiger pounced. And today, when Professor Dr. George Wilson Kanye Hamba was given the opportunity to speak, this is what he said, that I do not speak, my book speaks for me. And in less than two minutes, he had concluded his speech. Because like the tiger that he is, you follow the path of a tiger and you see the skeleton of an antelope and you know that some tigritude has emanated there. Today, we are here to look at this book. We follow his scholarly path and he does not have to give us a lengthy account as to whether he's a scholar, as to whether he's an erudite legal luminary, as to whether he's a great jurist, 
the books that he is written are themselves speaking in their most eloquent manner and we who are are at the great feet of a great man it is that great man who is accredited with spreading Christianity, the man called Paul of Tarsus or Saul of Tarsus who said that he had learned under the feet of Gamaliel. Today we are under the feet of Gamaliel. You know, when you talk about great men, a great things come to your mind and today many things come to my mind whom shall we compare him with if comparison is necessary sometimes it is if he was a river as the poet said he would be the nile of scholars if he was a bird, he would be the eagle of scholars. If he was a fish in the oceans, he would be the whale. If he was a tree and he were to be compared to a tree, he would be the fig tree and the iroko in Nigeria. That is the man that we are talking about. If he was a mountain, he would be the Kilimanjaro. Or the Himalayas. Not any word that I'm speaking this more this afternoon is hyperbolic. They describe the man. He is a colossus. And friend and foe alike have no choice but to celebrate him. George Wilson Kanye Hamba, I salute you. George Wilson Kanye Hamba, I come to praise you. And all of us who are present here have come here for only one purpose, to praise you, because you deserve praise. Ladies and gentlemen, in an assembly such as this, when we are praising a great man, when you see great men and women, and I would dare say that there are women of elegance and intellect present in this assembly. Today we are here in that capacity to celebrate our own. We have men of timber and caliber, officers and gentlemen, all of them are here to celebrate a good and an intelligent man. But why is George intelligent before I sit down? Because sit down I must now. He is intelligent because even in his intelligence he knows that he knows not all things. And that is his humility that he has taken time to give young men an opportunity to organize this occasion is his recognition that this struggle to ensure that knowledge is given longevity it must be from generation to generation <laughs> so that he has run his intellectual race and he has handed over the baton and he is now saying that my success as an academic will only be measured when I produce other younger academics. It used to be said that the beauty of a great giant is to be compared with mother cow. When mother cow is chewing cud, baby cow watches, and that is how you mentor young people. That is one of the reasons why I salute you. You know, Today, George Wilson Kanye Hamba would have invited some politician to give the keynote address, but in his own wisdom, as he deems it, 
He chooses a young person who is growing old by the day in my person to be the one that is to deliver this keynote. That is not to be taken for granted. He is simply saying that I'm handing over the baton even as I continue because you are not successful until your successor succeeds. <laughs> so, George, sit where you are sitting in the knowledge that you are today the personification of excellence. Sit where you are sitting in the knowledge that as the Greek stock of Socrates and Sophocles and Aristophanes, you are our very own. Sit there in the knowledge that as the German stock of Hegel, you are our very own. Sit there in the knowledge that you are greatness personified. Sit there in the knowledge that you have spread your knowledge and that you have immortalized yourself through these book which is your true magnum opus, evolution of constitutional law, public law, and good governance. We are wowed by your excellence. May God bless and protect you at all times. Be blessed. Thank you very much. Another round of applause for Professor Kal. I think one thing is clear that amidst all the gloom and conversations about the future of our young people, um, my Lord Justice Professor Kanyahamba has proven that we can begin to start part, passing the baton. That young people are getting ready, or at least are ready for the challenges that lie ahead. It's time for our panel discussion. And I have a very distinguished panel this afternoon that will be making about some of the issues in the keynote address and as well as the fundamental issues that are dear to Professor uh, Justice uh, George Wilson Kanyahamba. And my panel this afternoon has the former Prime Minister of this country. He also served as um, the Secretary General of the ruling National Resistance Movement Party he served in different capacities in cabinet. He served as attorney general of this great country, as minister for security, and as well as member of parliament for so many years, the right honorable John Patrick Amama Mbabazi. Thank you for honoring me. On the panel this afternoon, I have the honorable Norbert Mao, the president general of the Democratic Party, former member of parliament for Kulu municipality, former chairman LC5 of Kulu district, and former presidential candidate. Honorable Mao has uh, problems with the former title, but uh, at a young age, he has accumulated all those formers. <laughs> he, he joins the panel this afternoon. Uh, we have the Honorable Dr. Miriam Atembe. He's, an, uh, he's a lawyer. Uh, he served as Minister for Ethics and Integrity in this country, left a record in that office, served as Member of Parliament for so many years. Uh, the Honorable Matembe will be part of our panel this afternoon. And we have uh, we have uh, Dr. Lina Zedriga, a distinguished academic who has in the recent days actually ventured into politics. Um, I was welcoming her a few minutes ago from the campaign trail. Uh, I will not say much about how it was. We live in this country, we know how it went and the Vice President of the National Unity Platform in charge of Northern Uganda. The youngest probably on the panel is uh, Council Nicholas Opio. He is the team leader at Chapter 4 Uganda, doing a great job in human rights defense. He is um, an advocate of the High Court and a human rights defender, and, and he is now an old boy of Chitalia Prison. Um, <laughs> Councillor Nicholas will be part of our panel this afternoon and uh, finally all the way from a country that is believed to be an example for growing democracy on the African continent, 
uh, with great respect, we have uh, Mr. Bernard uh, Mona, is a managing partner, Ndama Ghana Limited and Vice President Saharan Economic and Financial Consortium. And he is a gentleman with a rich experience in different spheres of governance and as well as the management of public affairs. At least today I will not be accused of uh, ignoring the gender card. I can say that I have two distinguished women on the panel. The number will keep growing in the coming days. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll give each of you a minute to say a word about this giant that we celebrate today before we touch on some of the issues, uh, starting with you, Honorable Norbert Mao. In the African uh, context, many times we celebrate people when they are no more. What is that one thing that you want Professor George Wilson Kanyahamba to know when he's still breathing? You can kindly use the microphone in front of you. Can I kindly ask the sound technicians to help? I think we, we have sorted it out. I had the privilege of knowing Professor Kanyehamba first through his book, The Famous Constitution and Government of Uganda, which is now being updated. It was required reading. Those days we had what was called a reading list. And Professor Kanyehamba's book was on top of the list. I've read most of his books. His writings are accessible. Some people write, and their writings are impenetrable, like the Gwindi and Gahinga impenetrable forest. <laughs> I think Professor Kanyehamba seeks to be understood, not to bewilder those who read his books. He is also very frank, you could almost say rude, because he, he says things in such a manner that you can't misunderstand him. If you read this one, which actually is a very hilarious book, He's describing how he was marginalized when he was returning from exile to be a minister. And he was alongside Princess Bagaya Elizabeth. Here was somebody coming to be sworn in as a member of the cabinet. And here is this princess, very well known. She was promptly upgraded to the presidential suit with fresh flowers and fresh fruits. And true to his nature, Professor complains in the book that he looked and saw that he's flowers were not fresh <laughs> and, and neither were the fruits <laughs> so he, he appeared like he was being catered to in the shadow of Princess Bagaya it, it's a book really you should read tonight I, I couldn't put it down as for this one it's a, a biography of Uganda I know Professor Kanyehamba will have his biographers, but he has taken upon himself the task of writing the biography of Uganda. I have some complaints about his chapter on political parties, which, which I, I, will, I, I will discuss with him. There are some sweeping statements which I believe need more support. and uh, but. He also puts a mirror in front of our eyes and tells us the problems with political parties, which he calls the founding father syndrome. Fortunately, we don't have that disease in the Democratic Party. <laughs> because I'm the sixth president of the Democratic Party. Professor Kanyehamba, in case you had any doubt that you are still a crowd puller, Today you have got your answer. I wish I could share with you the list of people who are here. I haggled with the, the Deputy Speaker, the Right Honorable Jacob Olanya, because he was threatening not to come here because he has another meeting. And I told him, how can you not be seen? 
at the launch of Professor Kanyehamba's magnum opus, <laughs> as it has been described. The categories are all here, Professor. The military, the police, journalists, agitators from civil society, our tribe of politicians, the feminists, the anti-feminists, they are all here. Uh, they are active politicians, retired politicians, cabinet ministers, the clergy, people from traditional institutions, everybody is here. So, you may not be seeing everybody who is here, but I can assure you, you are still a crowd puller, and you have done it by not being physically visible very much these days. But you have done it. So today, we have to say that Professor Kanyehamba's life and work shows that ideas matter. Whether they are good ideas or bad ideas, ideas matter. They provide the fulcrum, the hinge on which the doors of the world turn. Professor P.L. Olumumba has appropriately said we have come here to lionize you because you have risen above like a towering tree in a forest of very tall trees. Naturally, we will not deify you. You are not a god. We must also talk about other aspects. The good thing is that you continue to grow. And growth means changing. I have been at the receiving end of your praises. Occasionally you have telephoned me, purely to lambast me. I won't talk about the things for which I was lambasted. But that is the kind of courage. Not just physical courage. Professor, the one thing I'll remember is your moral courage. They have talked about precedents in the laws, in the court law, courts of law. The one which will continue to haunt us for years is how election petitions should be handled, especially presidential election petitions. <laughs> that one will continue to haunt judges because you stood firm and you said a presidential election petition is not an ordinary trial. We must do an inquiry. That means the court should be able to step outside the fence of the Supreme Court, not bury its nose in the papers that are filed, and find out what went wrong and how it can be remedied. For that, you will always be remembered. Many times, what is considered a minority becomes the majority. In some cases, it is long after the minority has left. These days, we trek to the Uganda Matters Shrine at Namugongo. At that time, they were the most unpopular people. Nobody wanted to associate with them. Good enough in your lifetime, Professor. Your moral courage has become infectious. I want to confess that I'm also one of those infected by your moral courage. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Mono Batmao. I want to agree with you that sometimes the minority becomes the majority, except when we're talking about elections. There, um, the, the, the principle is quite different. The majority must reign supreme. We'll move forward to the Honorable Dr. Miriam Matembe. Um, your remarks on the life and times of Professor George Wilson Kanyehamba and your take home from the book, Honorable. Thank you very much, distinguished audience. First of all, I want to, you know, if you were introducing Kanyihamba at a time when we are talking about constitutional law, and you left what he is, you would tell you no, you didn't say it properly. So, as falling in his footsteps, <laughs> as we are launching a book on evolution of constitutional law, you should have remembered to tell the audience that I'm one of the 21 member of Dutch Commission that wrote the Constitution of Uganda, and that I was also a CA delegate, 
And together with the Honorable Kanyihamba, a member of the Legal and Drafting Committee that put the final stamp on the Constitution of Uganda. I am guilty as judged. Okay, having said that, that means falling in the footsteps of who? Of Professor Kanyihamba. <laughs> so that is one thing I remember. Now, I want to start by thanking God that we are here today to lionize Professor Kanyihamba while he's alive. Because it was very, very scaring at one time around Christmas is it, because Professor almost went. And he was going quietly. And you people would have cried alone. But now that he's here, still alive, and you are here to witness his launch of this book, as for me, I'm extremely happy for that. Because those moments were very sad when he was at Nakasero in a room alone. Oh my God. I pray to God that look here, Professor must leave. And I'm glad that when he lived, you see, he can never be defeated. He defeated that threat of, of, of death and came out now with this huge book. I mean, no wonder there is this book called Kanyihamba, the incredible. <laughs> you can imagine. After all that, he comes out with a book. You know how many of you have written books? At least that one thing I can remember about Professor is writing books, writing, 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 and defeating this horror talk of Africans don't read and they don't write. At least that one, I will remember that from him. And of course, me being a student, his student, as I read the other book also. That is the first time I read that book at Makiri in the first year. And I admired this man. I didn't know I would ever see him. You know, those days, he was far in exile. We are here as little children, reading the, the book and feeling good. I didn't know that I would ever meet him. And you can imagine by that time, I met him, I had also come up <laughs> as a member of parliament, and he's there also a member of parliament. And in cabinet, and I was there also. Can you imagine? Me, I thank God so much. You admire people you think you never meet or see them, and one day you find yourself seated with them, and also being like, like equal to them, of course, when you are not. And for me, I didn't stop there with Honorable Kanyihamba. Of course, I told you on the drafting committee together. And then Honorable Kanyihamba has his PhD from the University of Warwick, where I got my Master's of Law from. Don't you see I'm falling in his footsteps? <laughs> and then I have not reached those 31 books. But at least I have written four books or so. And the latest which you should read, like you must read this one, is the one entitled <laughs> The Struggle for Freedom. And what? You see, they haven't read it. Remember, you can tell them. <laughs> The struggle for freedom and democracy betrayed. So I'm following, I'm following. And I think that is the reason why I find myself seated here to talk about Professor. Of course, I have read this book. I've read many, many of his books. One of them called The Joy of Being Who You Are. All the humor, everything is there. Then, of course, Honorable Kanyihamba's truth-telling, I also follow in his footsteps. Fearless say it, whether they do what, they do it. But you have said your mind. And let me tell you, the joy of speaking your mind, whether they hate you or not, if you believe in what you are saying, 
makes you live. That's why he's living long and continuing to write. And I intend to follow in his footsteps by the grace of God. Of course, the moral standing you talked about, and most important, the courage, the determination to live on. Not to be, you can be deterred, but not bad. Continue to rise and rise. So for me, he's my hero. This, this book which he has written is really, I think, everybody, I mean, who wants to know about Uganda, the history, where we began to start talking of constitutionalism and that kind of thing. We need to read. Africans, please, let us not conform to the other talk that if you want to hide something from Africans, put it in a book. For me, if you put it there, I will find it. If there are adorers, I will pick them. So, finally, I want to thank Justice Professor Kanyihamba for coming out with this book at this age of knocking about 82. Others just work, they rest and go. But for him, he remains relevant and current. These things of former he's not accepting. <laughs> he remains current and relevant. To have written this book at a time when Uganda is being challenged of constitutionalism. I sit here as a member of that constitutional commission, as a CA delegate, as a member of the legal and drafting who came out with that constitution which has glorified all over the world as one of the best and yet it has been a used sacrifice i sacrificed my back making that constitution and thank you for writing this book so that the issues, and I expect the issues which will be debated here, will be debated with the constitutionalism and the rule of law and the government related to you. The success of Uganda is a direct result of your and your colleagues' efforts and dedication. Your commitment to quality, personal, and professional integrity is the differentiation factor that sets Uganda's success apart from many other countries. People, as we all know, are a nation's asset. Professor Kamihamba, your abilities, your contribution, all the work in your public life you have made for Uganda were an important key to the success of our nation's endeavor. And it is with great pride and admiration that I congratulate you for having made all those achievements that have been by Professor Lumumba. I, I am not sure that I would have words to speak after Professor Lumumba's presentation. The words he used, I have some of them for the first time. Magnus Opus. And I had not heard of it. So, congratulations on writing books, George. 31 books. Unlike uh, my sister, Honorable Miriam Atembe, I have not written any yet.
but I've uh, read the books of uh, Professor Kanyamba and I have given the impression that George has a passion for the part of him, those of you who know him, and he's always ready to show him. He does not tell stories as uh, soporific drugs to numb our minds or to induce sleep against the difficulties, confusion, and sometimes downright horror of our lives. Stories, of course, as we know, can be a force for evil. And of course, as we all know, in the modern world, Mass media is a tool for propaganda. So one should always ask himself or herself, is his or her stories contributing to society's downward, downward spiral? Are they hurting society? Or are they helping? But in his stories, George Kanehamba, the ones I have read, always hits a realistic but optimistic code. And that is no force for evil. As they say, the devil has no stories. Stories teach us to hope. We are all toiling like Remember the biblical story of the Hebrews in Egypt? Up to our knees in mud, you know, in dirt, in rubbish, in waste matter. We are all struggling to do the best we can. In the midst of that struggle, it can be so incredibly, ridiculously easy to pour our entire focus into the mud at our feet. We begin to think that's all there is. We forget to look up. We forget to hope. The stories remind us. They show us the big picture. They show us the world of another person's struggle and they remind us we are not surrendering to the darkness. Rather, we are walking in darkness to the light. And that is what George Kanyehamba's stories represent and give us hope. So I want to use this opportunity. Thank you, George, for, as always, leading the way. And those of us who have worked with you, in many ways, I didn't want to talk about them because I don't have time to do so, appreciate the light you've been, not only to Uganda, but to the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Right Honorable. Um, I, I was still uh, holding my breath and waiting, waiting for the last word because uh, uh, Right Honorable Mamambalazi was one of the most difficult uh, politicians to handle as a journalist. Uh, and he still remains. Um, many times as a young reporter I would meet him in the corridors of parliament and he would just hold me on the shoulder and say, you know where to find me, for, to find me, why are you were laying me on the way? Um, Always a pleasure hearing from you, sir. Uh, let's move to um, Council Nicholas Opio. Um, your recollections of, of Professor Kanyamba, but also because um, we have added human rights to your name, I want you to say a word to the issues that he writes about touching on fundamental principles in the country. If you can take the microphone right now, sir. Well, thank you very much, Joseph. 
It is an honor to be on the panel with these um, eminent senior citizens. For a minute, I thought my role here was to lower the age limit. Uh, and, and to raise the, uh, the, 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 the average height on the panel. Uh, I was a bit intimidated when I heard as well that the keynote speaker was the uh, Professor Pierre Lomumba. Joseph, as you know, he is only rivaled by the Honorable Mukasambide in the vocabulary they use while speaking in public. Uh, I didn't think I would match that, 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 uh, that, that standard. But that said, let me congratulate the Honorable Professor Dr. Wilson George Kanyahamba on the launch of his two books today. As a law student and my lecturer, Dr. Godal Musinje, uh, really in the army uniform right over there, he taught me jurisprudence. But they made it very clear to us that on constitutional history and law, the only book to read by a Ugandan author was the book of the Honorable Dr. Professor George Wilson Kanyahamba. There's no other book. I think even reflecting as an advocate, I don't think I have a book of that depth analysis of the constitutional history of this country. So I've, I met him as a law student way back in 2002 when I read his book. Many of the things I do now as a human rights lawyer was in part inspired by the writings of Professor George Wilson Kanyahamba. The judgments that I read over and over again for fun are judgments authored by the professor. I've also had the rare opportunity to practice law with him, to litigate cases with him. And there are two important cases that I want to talk about here. The challenge against the appointment of retired justice Benjamin Odoki as chief justice when he retired. At the time I was serving in the Law Society as the Secretary General of the Law Society, the Law Society did not have the courage to challenge the President on the appointment of the Chief Justice. We were convinced that the appointment was unconstitutional, was unlawful, because the good judge had reached the retirement age, and therefore unqualified, to be appointed Chief Justice. When the Law Society was afraid to challenge the President, the only person who stood forward to challenge this appointment was the good professor. And he called me and said, young man, come let's argue this case together. We argued that case together, we won it, and the appointment was rescinded. <laughs> the rest, as they say, is history. The second case that I was involved in, and the Honorable Ben Watcher is also in the audience, was the case of the rebel MPs. When the NRM, when you were still there, I don't know if you're still there. <laughs> it sought to expel members of parliament uh, of the NRM who had disagreed with the party. They, they sought to expel them from parliament. Um, a team of lawyers was put together to argue that case, and the Honorable Justice, uh, Dr. Wilson Kanyahamba, was among the, he was in fact the lead lawyer in that case, because he was the most senior advocate on the case. Reading his works and litigating cases with him deepened my admiration for the old professor. Because I recall one incident in which a judge whose name I won't mention attempted to hide a court file of a case we were handling, took the file and drove off to State House with it. And his escort, the guard's escort, called us and said, you know where we are going, we are going to State House. So we had to mount a siege at the High Court to arrest the judge from hearing this case stiffly with the NRM lawyers. And the Honorable Justice Kanyamba was our big weapon. We mounted him at the court corridors so that the judge could not have any chance to hear this case after 7 p.m. as he had intended. Old as he is, he did not give up, he sat there. 
in one incident, in, in fact, he cried at the injustice that was being occasioned by uh, a bench, a panel in the High Court, or a register of the, of, the, of, the, of the Court of Appeal. He shedded tears. Many people saw it in the press and thought it was drama. But for those of us who are watching at very close ranges, we can tell you it was not drama. His deep commitment to the rule of law, to constitutionalism, is something I have witnessed myself. And I want to thank you, Prof, for your deep and abiding commitment to constitutionalism, the rule of law, and the respect for human rights. Many have spoken about his courage, his, his ability to speak the truth. You can count on your fingers and you won't finish in the first hand how many judges in this country would have the willpower to annul a presidential election petition. The Honorable Professor Pierre Lumumba was a party to a case in Kenya in which the Kenyan uh, courts nullified the presidential election. We came closest to that before them in Uganda because of Professor George Wilson Kanyahamba. The Honorable Norbert Bao spoke about his definition of a presidential election petition as, as an inquiry and therefore the courts provide a finding, not a judgment. But the one thing he may not have mentioned as well is the principle that if a single violation of the law of the constitution occurs in the process of an election, it is enough to annul the election. It was his resounding argument in response to the question of the substantiality test. Those who say the theft must be so much so that to affect the result. But he, he argued the contrary and said, if there is a violation of the law and the constitution, that should be enough to annul a presidential election petition. So in fact, in light of the recent election petition that uh, the NUP, uh, Dr. Lina here, and, 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 and her group took to court, maybe there are some lessons to learn uh, from a good old professor. Lastly, people say he's arrogant, but I think that he's a, a man of humility. And let me explain before you object that he's not a man you can say has humility as, as, as a characteristic. For somebody who rose to the pinnacle of legal profession, to the Supreme Court, when he retired, he picked up his books, went and opened a law firm, and began to argue cases before his own students. In one case, a judge who had been inspired to go to law school by him was sitting in a panel to adjudicate a case in which he was counsel. And when the judge mentioned something, he shot up and said, I'm the one who inspired you to go to law school. <laughs> Is that what I inspired you to go and do? <laughs> but you can imagine picking up his books, his, 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 uh, his flaps, and gown, to go and practice before uh, a high court judge, before a court of appeal judge, and before the Supreme Court, when in fact he had risen to the pinnacle of the legal profession. So Prof, today I celebrate you. Uh, you inspire me, you inspired me, you inspire me, and will continue to inspire me through your works, through your power of example. Nothing is off limits to Prof, and I can go on and on, but let me spare you time. I thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nicholas. You spoke about balancing the height, and I wish you could see. They had to put something for me to reach the microphone. So our panelists are not as bad as, as I am doing. Let's listen to... Uh, uh, Mr. Bernard Manner uh, uh, about his recollections, but also probably bringing in an experience from Ghana in regard to constitutionalism, sir. If you can kindly take up the microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, I find myself in an environment where I'm not expected to be. This is not West Africa, this is East Africa. And so my tonation and my soundings may not be as clear as you want it to be, but you have to manage. First, I have known Professor for a very long time. 
very, very long time to the extent that when he was actually he escaped from Idi Amin's raft and was in the United Kingdom in 1974. I was just about six months old. And I only read about him. The closest I came to knowing him was just yesterday, meeting him physically. So this is how long I've known him. But within the long period that I have known him, I can see that he feels that he is not an accomplished man. That there are many things he should have done which he could not do, and that he wants to do them, even as age and energy will not permit him. Yesterday and this morning, as we're having breakfast with him, in narrating some of the stories, he was crying. He was not just shedding tears. And I'm sure Pierre Lumumba would admit that the young professor shed tears over the struggles that he has been through and could not believe that he was doing this in liberation of his own nation and continent. I was surprised that of the many people around the continent that he could find me ready to come and join this panel to discuss issues on constitutional law, public law, and government. But I take it from the fact that because he wants to encourage many young people and he knows that I've been arrested struggling for the people of Togo, he's aware I have beaten in Burkina Faso when we were struggling to get Blaise Kampauri out. He's aware that I was in Gambia and that soldiers were chasing me through the Kasamas region. And he's also aware that I've been arrested many times in my own country, Ghana. He thought I could come and share some of the experiences with you. But one thing that I have learned in all this is that he has worked in all the arms of government. He has been a legislator. He has been an administrator that is a minister. He has also been at the pinnacle of the law. And everything that he does means that politics define everything. And I want the many of us who are here to understand that your being a judge is shaped by the kind of politics that is in place. Your being a doctor medical doctor or an engineer or an agriculturalist is shaped by the kind of politics and political leadership that we have. To the extent that what we eat, how much of it we can produce, to the extent that the kind of education we should have, to the extent that the kind of health system that should be in place, to the extent that the kind of water we should drink to the extent that the sanitation of our environment, to the extent that whether we will have freedoms or our freedoms will be trampled upon, are all a function of politics. But I see many of us, because of our professions, we choose not to engage in the politics because, as we have said repeatedly, politics is seen as a dirty game. But I don't see a profession or an institution that feeds you, that educates you, that clothes you, that heals you to be a bad thing. There may be bad people within. And it is on that score that I see Professor as one of the few good politicians who will do everything to fight the bad ones so that politics can be clean to lead us to the promised land where liberties will not be trampled upon. So, for the long period of yesterday and today, I think I've known Professor enough to say that there is much more for him to accomplish and he will not die now because our oracles will protect him. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, we will have um, Dr. Lina Zedriga.
thank you so so much um in the interest of time i'll try to be very very brief uh professor dr george wilson kanye hamba when i was still on the bench i was coordinating the national association of women judges which is an umbrella organization for women judges and magistrates and our president was the late deputy chief justice may her soul rest in peace we addressed a letter i addressed a letter to professor to come and give us a keynote address we're having an international conference and instead of writing his name wilson i wrote it as william In his tough love, he made it known to me that I needed to go back. I, I did not have to correct that on the envelope, but to go and make it right and neat. So, professor teaches you not to compromise standards. You don't compromise standards, and there are no quick fixes. I want to thank you so much, professor, for that. He taught me not to accept a falsified identity. Linda. I always say, no, no, no. Cross the D. It is Lina. You know, the number of us who will accept. But Professor taught me that what is not your identity, your name, please do not take it. Professor, thank you. The second was about two, three weeks ago. I got a call from Professor. And he was following up on the NOOP, the, my party's uh, process in court, the petition. At that time, I was up north. I had a lot of uh, pressure from the candidates, those who were being abducted, and you know, people are not sleeping in their houses. And so, Professor calls me and says, Doctor, uh, this is Professor, and I would like uh, to have a conversation over you. Do you want to win the case? And of course, I had also my own stress. I told him, Professor, to be honest, I really don't care whether we win the case or not. Here is his response to me. Professor went hyper. You don't care? Are you a Uganda? You don't care? I said, yes, I don't really care. Professor repeated it to me. So I put it to you. You must care. And we must meet. To me, he took personal journey to correct me, to put me in a position that I should not take my personal emotions above Uganda. He put it to me, Uganda is above all of us. Thank you so much, Professor. <laughs> Finally, Professor is the tiger the ego professor is that person who mentors beyond who, who, who mentors without any expectations because a lot of us now are you from north then i can mentor you are you a woman then i can mentor you are you but professor mentors without a second or third judgment professor thank you for being that open book that we read from because a lot of us now associate because this one is a maybe a catholic because but professor i put it to you thank you so 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 much because you give time to mentor us to correct us in utmost good faith you today have made me reflect as a Christian. Many of us lament. You have left that book of lamentation. You brought us here to the Acts of the Apostles and together you're enabling us to create a future, the revelation of how we must relate to one another, of looking at the bigger picture, of being Ugandans, of knowing that we are safe to be who we are because right now we have false 
insecurities created. Professor, today, for the first time, by the way, I'm feeling safe. I'm no longer looking at which car is stopping where because I've been chased by drones and so on. But today you have made me feel very safe. And I hope we can all learn that Uganda is bigger than us. That it is okay to belong to the NUP. It's okay to belong to the North. It's okay to belong to whichever political party. Thank you so, so much. Let us celebrate, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lina Zaluga. Looking at our time, um, time is not our best ally. We're moving straight to the audience. And instead of sitting here and asking these panelists more questions, I will throw it to the audience based on the book, Revolution um, of Constitutional Law, Public Law and Government. If you have a particular question to anyone on the podium here, you can shoot or a particular comment. But um, what is important is that everyone is going to have a minute uh, to raise their point because time is not our best ally. We really need to keep moving. I'll ask uh, the microphone to move around and we'll get reactions, questions or comments uh, from the audience. We'll start with uh, uh, Justice uh, Chaudhry here. He has been lifting his hand from the time. This gen uh, the panelists were speaking, so we'll start with him right away. Kindly sanitize the microphone before. Honorable, Honorable Chief Guest, Jose Olanya, my OB at Laibi College, Kulu. Honorable Chief, uh, whatever it is, uh, and uh, distinguished guest. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Kanihamba for inviting me to this function. Tonight, I was flying out to the UK and I haven't done my packing, but there is no way I could have missed coming here. So I'm so happy that I am here. 45 years ago, I was an undergraduate at Cambridge University. At Cambridge, I was taught not only the law, but intellectual understanding of the law, which is different from other institutions in the world. And that gave me passion of writing books. And my latest book is this Sikh Genocide, 84, which has been acclaimed worldwide. It was launched last year by Lord Carlyle at Grazing Square, the famous institution where many of the barristers are trained. Now, the purpose of writing books is not just copy and paste. It is to develop and crystallize law so that you can develop the jurisprudence in that subject. So when the book was being launched, I raised a question when I was speaking. I said, can the killing of Karenites in the Bible, I am a Sikh, but I know a little bit of Bible. Actually, I know a lot of it because I went to missionary schools. And can tsunami be a genocide? I said that should be a question which, which should be put to Cambridge typos. So it is important that I write books, and I'm very, very happy that Professor Kanihamba has written books, amazing books, great intellectual, great academic, and a great judge. And while I'm here, I want to give him the honorable title of Lord Denning of Uganda. Yay! If you all agree, in future, we shall call him Lord Denning of Uganda. How about that? Proposed by Justice Chowdhury. Now, I don't want to take any more of your time, but I salute you as an academic. I have highest respect for you. And it is not only Justice Karihamba, 
and Justice Chowdhury, who should be writing books. We want more judges in our judiciary to be writing books. And I think the country has to change its education system. They have got to learn to understand intellectually the subject they are studying. And that will give them the passion of writing and of reading. Thank you so much. May God bless you. May you have a long life. This is Karihaba. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justice Shabri. Um, if I can pass the microphone to Professor Mondo Kagwanyera here. Let's kindly keep time so that we can have um, a considerable number of people contribute. Thank you very much, Professor Kanyehamba, the panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Up to now, only lawyers have spoken. Oh, he's not a lawyer. Thank God. <laughs> Very often in this country, lawyers are called liars. And deliberately so. There's another lawyer heckling me down here. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm obliged to speak. Today, because Israel, probably I'm the one who has known Professor Kanye Hamba longer than anybody else here. When I first knew I was a human being, I was staying no more than two kilometers from Professor Kanye Hamba's ancestral home. And the Professor Kanye Hamba is my uncle. You may think that Professor Kanye Hamba is just what he is because of his legal training only. No, you miss the point. First of all, Professor Kanyihamba is a Muchiga. And you know what we are known of? Being blunt, speaking the truth, being frank, being hardworking, you name it. And that's what that man is. Secondly, in his formative years, Professor Kanyehamba was lucky to go through schools that we are managed by church foundations. Schools like Nyaruhanga, those who know, Nyakatare, and above all, Kigez High School. If you were ever went through Kigez High School in our days, you had no choice but to be a Kanyihamba. Look at another one. <laughs> yes! Yes! Therefore, I don't want you to underestimate the formative years of anybody's life. I want you people stress the value of being good parents. If you are a thief, what do you expect your children to be? You are a mother, you bring home unexplained goods. What do you expect your daughter to be? So I thought I should say this. You know one of the major problems we have in Africa. We go to school we are literally taught to be parrots. We are never forced to be analytical in what we do. And there was still, there is less and less, professor, less and less, stress is put on soft skills. You can have all the skills in the world, whether it is in law, Veterinary medicine like me, mathematics, but if you lack in soft skills, you're as useless as anybody could be. That's why corruption flourishes in this country. Because the corrupt don't see anything wrong with the corruption. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bob. I will speak to the, the lady right next to Prof.
Good afternoon, everybody. I'm the chair sector. I used to be George Kanyeham. I was actually more of his sister than a colleague. Uh, one thing about, let me say just one thing about the book. George, thank you very much for writing all those books you have written. Because for a reason I don't understand, Ugandans just don't want to write. And especially now that we have got this phones and the computers they don't write i want to beg everybody here especially if you are above 40 please start writing your story we wrote say professor and i was at uh, Lubaga who are praying but in the book they had already started distorting his story which he had written so we could not argue and I'm like, I was there. This is not what happened. Why should we argue about a professor's life when you can write? Really? Taking on the case because the courts had ordered government to produce the arrested person before the courts of law as was required by law. Then each one had the courage to say, if nobody can take on this case, I'll take it on. And he took it on. And the last exchanges between the chief justice before he was murdered, and to this day, we don't know why his body was dumped. The president called him and asked Benedicto Chiwanuka, you say you are the chief justice? And you have the power to order us to produce the prisoner. I'm asking you one question in Uganda. Who has more power? The Chief Justice or the President of Uganda? And Idi Amin banged down the phone. And you know what happened to Benedict, Benedict Chuanka. That was the end of his life. When we have Professor Kanyihamba standing up to speak the truth to power. He is a blessing to this country from God. When we had the black Amanda estate, in Entebbe came people to see me and talk about what to do. And one of the most disheartening things people are saying, including those in the judiciary, Gukina, what can we do? Can we do this? Can we do this? But Dr. Gukina, do you want me to be killed? Those are words for our judges. So you cannot talk about an independent judicial Uganda when the judges are sweating under their cows because a judge can say, I'm appointed for life. You cannot fire me. And the, the president simply tells you now you are dead. And you are dead. So you are independent and appointed for life. So my fellow Ugandans, I'm so grateful to be here because I see the personalities that have come to this occasion. This Uganda is yet to be free because we, can talk, we cannot tell the truth like a Professor Kanyehamba does. Had we had a, even a hundred Kanyehambas in this country, we won't be in the mess we are in. First, we must be honest with ourselves. Two, self-deception. Three, optimism and greed that we can never say the truth because the truth is that Uganda has been under gun rule since 1966 and Uganda is still under gun rule so you cannot pretend to have presidential elections putting a horse before the cart what Ugandans must do we must find a way of ending gun rule then we can talk about democracy. I thank Professor Kanye Hamba, and I'm requesting my fellow Ugandans, we better emulate him, 
Tell truth to power, be honest with ourselves, and serve this country better so that we can get the Uganda we deserve. Thank you very much. I'm afraid uh, time is not our best. I will return microphone, the microphone back. We have to manage time on the without due respect. Uh, we'll turn the microphone back to uh, the panelists here. The, to respond in a minute each to if you can pick on any of the issues raised from the audience and, and give a quick response. I'll start with you, Dr. Zedriga, right here. Kind, kindly use a minute because we, we have to move. Most of them were celebrating uh, Professor and we want to thank each one of you. Mine is to say uh, the book that we are launching today gives us a reawakening about where we need to be in, as a country, where we have come from, and some of us who are actually now in the political activism. It's interesting to see some of the experiences in the past and then where the militarization and the brutality has reached especially some of i was reflecting uh professor about constitutionalism and that particular day in oyam where i was arrested by uh, over 50 military men i was reflecting every chapter by the way and placing it where where is the application of law here eh? and then i was also imprisoned with men in the same prison is this the uganda we are supposed to be living for our grandchildren so let us take the book and practice whether we're in the military whether we are in whichever offices it's time for us to be accountable for protecting human rights for promoting rule of law in our own ways thank you thank you very much Thanks. Well, I, I can glean from the book that the issue of tribal politics is very glaring in Uganda and that it is important to do away with tribalism because it is one of the key things that is killing confidence in our democracy and the growth of constitutionalism. Tribalism obviously breeds corruption and it also affects the judiciary that are supposed to lead the way to ensure that there is free and fairness in our society. But when the judiciary itself becomes corrupt and becomes bankrupt of the law, then citizens suffer. The end is that they are urging us to defy constitutionalism, democracy, and to go to the streets and to revolt against a system that we have toiled to build. This book teaches us that if we have to go forward as Ugandans, as Africans, then we must respect the tenets of constitutionalism, public law, and governance. The other thing that I see clearly is that our institutions still resides in the colonial infrastructure and largely also in the colonial mentality until we are able to disengage ourselves from the colonial infrastructure and also take away the kind of mindset that led to our ability to overthrow the colonial government probably will get worse than we are feeling today one of the things is that everything government in the days was seen as we have to undermine the government in order to clear off the colonialists. Today, there is no colonialist that is leading us. We are our own, but public servants, people in government and in top positions want to steal from their own, which they describe as government property. The more we do this and politicians are seen as the only ones who can get enriched, 
and the others in society if you are not in politics it means that you do not have to share in the spoils of our nation you are not building democratic institutions constitutionalism and public law suffers and our government definitely would collapse so i think in effect the book teaches us how we were as a protectorate how we moved on and the various governor, governments that have come in what they did and what we are experiencing now my final word on this matter is that saliva when it, you have saliva you want to spit it out but there is a popular saying in west africa that when you keep water in your mouth for too long it becomes saliva and you don't keep saliva in your mouth you spit it out so those who are in government and want to be in government forever it doesn't matter what good you may have done your longevity also becomes saliva that must be stirred out <laughs> if caution is not taken in the course of spitting out we may disengage our system and it's important for leaders to know that we cannot continue to be the only ones with good knowledge and that is why probably we celebrate Kanyehamba because he has tutored many young people that will take over from him from where he has left thank you thank you very much Great, thank you very much. There are no questions to the panelists, so I'll take this chance just to offer a few thoughts in about a minute. First, let me just say this, that every civilization is underpinned by knowledge. Um, and my friend Timothy Kalejira is in the audience, we argue about this all the time, that there is an obsession about material wealth in this country, who drives the best car, who wears the latest watch, who holds the latest phone. But if you look across civilization, every civilization was underpinned by a deep commitment to the production of knowledge and the consumption of knowledge. Uh, whether you go back to the kingdoms of Kush before the Egyptian Empire, or to the land of the Puntin, the Puntland, in the areas around Somaliland, Nagesia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, all those ancient civilizations were really strong because of their commitment to deep knowledge. And I hope that the writings of Dr. George Kajahamba would inspire us to have a higher commitment to knowledge, not, not, not wealth and power. Because power and, 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 and wealth without knowledge is useless. Whether you give a man all the money or a woman all the money and power, if they are not committed to knowledge, that money will be useless, that power and wealth will be useless. I hope that we can commit to that. And secondly, let me offer a criticism of Dr. Kanyehamba in his presence. In all his works, he appears to be, he appears to be indoctrinated by Western ideas of constitutionalism and the rule of law and human rights. I hope that in his, in his next book he can reflect on the Chigezi concept of justice, the African concept of communal uh, rights as opposed to individual rights and freedoms. Uh, and perhaps one of the books I read is, and, and I think Apollo Makubia is here, is, is a book on, 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 on Buganda. Many people, including the Buganda, think Buganda is a kingdom. Buganda is not a kingdom. I think Buganda is a nation state that predates the Uganda that we know. And we think of it as a traditional backward barbaric system. But in fact, Buganda is a nation state. And perhaps we need to begin to think about the African nation state if we are to deconstruct the instruments of colonial leadership uh, in this country. And I hope that uh, you know, Kanyahamba can, can help us benefit from his knowledge to reflect on these sort of ideas going forward. Um, otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you.
I really don't have much to add, um, except to emphasize the point I made earlier, that in the many books, I'm not only talking about this um, evolution of constitutional law, I am talking about the many books uh, Professor Kanyamba has written, including this one, Media Waved Around, Kanyamba the Incredible. And I I recommend that you study it because uh, it tells you exactly where Kanyehamba is coming from and where he is now. It's a story uh, that gives out just truth from what I know of him. And as I said before, stories are fundamentally truth. Even when the author didn't intend it to be so, even when he's not aware of it, or even when the reader is not aware, a story is always a statement. If it is, if it is to ring true, then what it says must reflect realities. It must reflect what is true. And that's what Kanihamba writes. And what is true is always good, whether it is beautiful, whether it is dark, whether it is healing, whether it is painful, truth is always a beacon, a guiding light pointing us back to the best days in our lives. And that is what Kanyahamba represents. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. As we conclude this talk in congratulating Professor Kanyihamba, I would like to thank him once again for enabling us to pay tribute to him when he is alive. Because one thing I have seen here in Uganda and even other African countries the moment you are off the public life, you are a reject, you are spent grain, they don't want to even know and see you. But Professor Kanyamba, by his own works, he remains alive. You see the audience he has called today. It's like he's still officially <laughs> working in this government. So I want to thank God that many times we do eulogies. When imagine if we were all talking when he had gone, he would not even know what we are saying. But today we got opportunity to say it when he's hearing, and I'm sure from tonight his health is going to be even better, and he will know. Yeah, people still know me, and they love me. And I want to say that all of us came here because we love and honor Professor Kanyihamba. I want to say, you know our motto is for God and my country. And our national anthem hands Uganda into the hands of God. So I want to quote a scripture where Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes. He said, then feed my lamb. And he asked him again, do you love me? Peter said, yes. Jesus said, then feed my lamb. And the third time, do you love me? He, Peter said, but Lord, you know I love you. Now we have come here because we love, we honor, and cherish Kanyam. Are we ready to feed his lamb? What did Jesus mean? He meant, if you love me, for, learn my principles and my values. Follow them, put them in practice, and preach them to others. We are at this time here debating this launch. At a time when almost all Ugandans are so scared. They've been pushed in, I don't know where. 
they are so afraid. You know why I say this? Because in situation where they should come out and really say, but surely this is not right. Then be the honorable. Don't you fear? Where do you stay? And me, I stay in home. No offense, Mshega knows my place. And even just this Kanyamba, no offense, no nothing. But I stand up and say, I respect the truth. Because the truth will set us free. Please, let us abandon fear. The word of God says, don't fear, don't fear, don't fear. God knew that there would be circumstances which would make us fear. And that's why he said, don't fear, for I am with you. For me, my call to all of us here who have been able to come here to honor George is that please let us rise up and follow his principles and values and stand for what is right and be able to say it, speak to power instead of being swallowed and just disappear the way we seem to be doing. George. I congratulate you. I thank you that God was able to make me see you. I think it was 20 years, more than 20 years after reading your book. And I'm glad that slowly, slowly, I'm also following in your footsteps. May the good Lord continue to bless you now and forever. Thank you. So the, the last shall be first. It's not an accident that we are gathered at this point of time with the kind of audience of concerned people here. Uganda is at a defining moment. And when you are lost, you look for familiar places. Those who don't know Kampala, in order to be found by those who know Kampala, will always make a reference to familiar places. They will say, where do I go if I'm at the Queen's clock? But what do you do if the Queen's clock has been demolished? <laughs> the Constitution is our Queen's clock, or Constitution Square, or wherever. Ugandans are hungry for those familiar places, things that don't change. Ugandans need a compass. Professor, whatever we have said here defines you as an unchanging tool, a point of departure, a compass. When you are finding a point on earth, you refer to the the prime meridian, the Greenwich medium, or the equator. Ugandans need those familiar things that don't change. Finally, I wish to underscore what Nicholas Opio said. Books are about knowledge, information, opinions also. You have talked about government. The word we have not used here is power. And we now must admit that you personify the power of knowledge. From your wheelchair, you are like an atomic bomb unleashing power, power of knowledge. Power has been changing in its nature. First, it was the monarchies, symbolized by their castles and big buildings belonging to the feudal lords. Then power changed and was vested in religious institutions, churches, and so on. Again, symbolized by the big mosques and cathedrals. Then power shifted to the state, symbolized by the houses of parliament like Capitol Hill, Westminster, even our very own here. The Bulange, those were houses for expressing the power of 
government or the state. Now power has shifted to corporations, the multinationals. Everybody talks about the headquarters of Apple, the headquarters of Google, the headquarters of Huawei. But one thing that has been running through like a thread is the power of knowledge. We celebrate you because you are our guru. Guru is not an English word, but it has become an English word. It is made of two syllables, gu and ru. Gu means darkness. And ru is he who dispels darkness. The kind of corruption and problems we face today is because there are those who spread darkness in order to deceive us, rob us of our rights, and misgovern us. Therefore, as a dispeller of darkness, you can't be a friend to those who spread darkness. Because darkness and light are in constant contention. That fight will never end. We are told that light will eventually prevail, but darkness is not going to give up. I believe there are many points of light in this country. We just need to connect them. Today you have connected us. I hope those who have been gathering the contacts of all those who are here will give us a gift so that we know each other. You never know. You may have seen somebody you haven't seen here for so long. This is a gift you have given to us, Professor. And I know that in a way you continue to be a guru, to be the light that combats the darkness without compromise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Finally, we have only two items. It's, I'll ask us to put our hands together and welcome our chief guest, the Deputy Speaker of Parliament, to speak to us right now. And also preside over the official launch of the book. And after that, we'll only have a word of thanks, a vote of thanks from the Honorable Manya Mushega. I think it's safe for me to remove this since uh, it has been sanitized. <laughs> Certainly not you. I'm just respecting the people who are going to listen to me. I need their consent that I can do that. Thank you. And a good evening. Professor, thank you for bringing us together, and I'm delighted to be here. I had challenges, but I'm here. I thank God that I'm here. I too received an invitation from professor, professor himself that I should come and actually be guest of honor. And I said, guest of honor? Well, I'll do that. And when I came here, I was actually delighted to see that uh, I am guest of honor, fairly good about it. Until Professor Lumumba spoke. And what did he say? He said, Professor did not invite some politician to come and be, give keynote speech in his book launch. <laughs> Have you ever been in that situation where you're sitting somewhere and immediately people start speaking and you think they're speaking about you? <laughs> That's how I felt. That is why Professor Kanyama did not invite some politician to give a keynote speech. I was deeply touched by that statement. But then I also drew comfort from seeing so many of them all over the place. <laughs> My eyes couldn't get off former Secretary General, former Minister, former everything. 
Amanya Mushega, who somebody else from West Nile used to call another name. Dick Nyai. You, you, you used to call you another name. Instead of Amanya Mushega, he would say something else. I was happy to see Victoria Sector Lego, very qualified in her own way, but a politician too. Then I saw Yona Kanuma, today he's not wearing a bow tie, but. <laughs> then I looked at her and I saw Penny Watch. I said, We are many. Some politician. Then I saw Mao. Then I saw me, Dr. Maria Matembe. Then I saw the right honorable prophet, uh, pro, uh, uh, Mama Mbaba. Then I saw the national vice chair of NUP. I say we are all over the place, so I am safe. <laughs> so I have said I settled down. But then that was not the settling factor for me. Because I also saw Professor Elijah Mushemeja there. Professor, been defeated twice in elections, now he has come as a member of parliament elect. Politician. And so many of you I recognize the Honorable Cecilia Wall, politician of I don't know how many centuries now. <laughs> I also recognize my Lord Justice uh, Remy Kasule. I know him in another way. Very kind man. God should create only such people to live. But what was more comforting for me was not the fact that there were so many politicians in the room. Ben Watcher is there. What was more comforting for me was that you could have a professor Kanyehamba a professor, PhD, in law, a politician, Minister of Commerce, Minister of Justice, Land Attorney General, I think, if I remember correctly, but he's not as wealthy as he should have been going by the standards of those who occupy those offices at the current moment. So that was the comforting fact for me that you can have a politician, yes, a politician, who after occupying all these huge offices can still be broke, can still be humble. What that shows is that there are some brand of politicians who will never risk dipping their hands in the people's money. <laughs> George Kanyamba is one side politician. So that was the more refreshing fact for me. That no, even in politics, you have those who never touch people's toji kwataku things. <laughs> you have them. You have people who Toji Kwata go public funds. So that was the more comforting fact for me. And how I want to emulate Dr. Kanyehamba to be one such politician who will be there, serve there, finish the term, and continue with humility in my other life. That was the comforting fact. I too, like all these lawyers who have read books of uh, Professor Kanyam, I also did by compulsion because I must, I was told, I had to read them. I have known Professor Kanyamba not for many years, but a few, enough to know a few things about him. I met Professor Kanyam in the company of an English judge. Talk about early beginnings and challenges of culture differences. He told us a story. When he went to London for the first time, I think to the UK, let me put it that way, I think there was a system called uh, uh, family something, family schooling, where you, families host students. No, no, not homeschooling. You go to school, but you stay in a home instead of staying in a, in a, in a 
in a, in a, in a, you stay with the family instead of being in a... He told us a story of a dinner that he had when he first arrived. Being from uh, Igezi, meat lover like many of you are, they brought food for dinner. And there was this one huge steak that had been put in the middle of the main plate. So he said, well, this is it. So he lifted the entire set <laughs> and put it on his plate. And with glee, he starts going through this steak. And the family was now proceeding with other matters. And then he was polite enough to ask the family, say, you people are not going to eat? <laughs> and then they said, no, today we are going to eat salad only. And he said, he did not know that at that time, he had eaten the entire family dinner all by himself. <laughs> I remember that story, Professor George Ganyamba, and I laughed because it was so funny and yet so real. I mean, many of us can relate to that. When you cross cultures, you make mistakes that sometimes you don't even know you're making them. But there it is. In the company of the same English judge, years later, after Professor Kanyama had been dropped from being the Attorney General, he came and they were having a light drink, and he said, you know, this man is not good. And I was there listening. I said, which man? President Museveni, he's not good. I said, why? I sat with that man up to 3 a.m. in the night, working on the new cabinet list and my name was there <laughs> when i woke up and the list was out my name was not there that man is not good <laughs> professor i don't know whether you remember this story you told it in my presence and we laughed about it like you are laughing now When he became a justice, at one point I became the chair of the Legal Committee of Parliament, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee. And we're dealing with really tough things. We're reviewing almost the entire constitution, more than 118 articles of the constitution. Honorable Norbert Mao was in the committee. But of the people who are permanently our resource persons, who you would call and would show up at no notice, Say, so, Professor, can we see you? We have this issue to discuss. Professor Jay Kanyaha was one of them. He gave us guidance anytime we needed it. He came and sat with us. He took us through everything. The other one was the late Justice Molenga. They were very open and shared everything. But not so many of them in the bench were that ready and willing to come and share. So I give you credit for that, Professor George Cunningham, for always extending, extending the frontier of knowledge that you have a lot to uplift human beings. Then we attended a seminar. Somebody talked about, uh, I think Honorable Mao said, Professor Kanyamba is very frank. I think he should have said, sometimes he's frank to the point of rudeness. Because that's what it is. He can so be so brutally frank that you even regret why you ever engaged in that conversation with him. But that's him. And when one time I was discussing him with another Muchiga, Certainly not the right honorable prime minister, former prime minister. You are not the one, you are not the one that's discussing. Another Muchiga, but he passed away unfortunately, he used to work for... So we are discussing Professor Kanyamba and his frankness which borders on being rude. And the man told me, and he was a Muchiga, he said, you know what, uh, honorable, I was not honorable then, he said, honorable, uh, no. you know what, Jacob, 
The diplomacy of the Bachiga is the sheer lack of it. <laughs> so I understood, <laughs> but I see it uh, on right honorable Amama Baba is really trying to outlive this uh, Kigezi uh, Chiga thing to try it. But sometimes he also lo loses it once in a while. <laughs> Once in a while, Kigezi comes back. So, the diplomacy of the Bachiga, that man said, is the sheer lack of it. And I understood Professor Kanyihamu. And one time we were at a seminar in uh, La Africana, and he had given a presentation, a very good constitutional, to members of parliament. And some member was very upset with the president of the professor. And then he said, Honorable, if you have not understood it, I'll ask my son to come and read it for you. Who could say that to a member of parliament? Only Kanye Hamba could. If you didn't understand it, Honorable, I'll ask my son to read it for you. Now, that's as rude as it can get. And it can only come from a man of his. But all of you, all of you also remember, when he was in the bank, he said this country one time. The constitutional, the constitutional court on a petition, I don't remember the party, I think Zachary Olum, Samugere and somebody else, challenged the enactment of the referendum act successfully but the referendum had already been conducted under that law and when the act was nullified the constitutional court went far enough to say all things transacted under it are therefore null and void and the right honorable uh, Mama Bazi, Baba Bazi was the attorney general at that time he was handling for government. I still remember vividly the deployment that emerged in the city. Was not very, very happy about that judgment. The act had been nullified and all acts, all actions that had been taken and implemented under the authority of the law was nullified. That means the referendum that was conducted under that law had been nullified. And certain offices, certain elections had already been conducted under the authority of the change law. Just imagine the stampede. When the matter went to the Supreme Court, it was him that saved the moment. When no other judge or justice of the Supreme Court had a way out, he did it. <laughs> and he said the act could have been nullified. But the act of a referendum is authorized by the Constitution. So it was conducted under the authority of the Constitution, which is still law in force. That's how that situation was saved. So that's why we are here, speaking the way we are here and speaking the way we are doing. Probably our language could have been more modified if at that time the rule had not gone back to elections and so on. So probably somebody could have just come and said to help with these systems, we'll just take it over and do it as we please. Probably these lamentations will not be coming because it will be a reality that we will be running away from. Because from my understanding and where I stand, we need a country that is better, that is for sure. But we will never desire a country that is as good as the first 24 years of our independence. We'll never desire that one. The next five years, the next 10 years must be better than the last five. And that's what I did. I don't believe in chaos. Those of you
you will see me sometimes don't understand me. I carry scars on my body made by bullets. Some of you just speak from your comfort zones without even understanding what other people went through. And you loud and you call people to demonstrate when your own children are not in the mix. Other people's children get hurt. That's sad. We should strive to make a country where we all feel comfortable. If you have some discomfort, there must be ways within the system to redress the discomfort. And we should live by that. But when you are calling people, like it happened, calling people's children to come and do certain things, it may not be fair. At least if your own children were part of the front line, it would make a lot of sense. This country we can make better without violence. We have seen enough of it without chaos. We have seen enough of it. That's what I say. If Professor Kanyamba did not make the judgment he did in that referendum petition, probably the discussions would be taking different shape. I have a peace ambassador, Kabula, here. Is a peace ambassador. So I also am one of those people who stand for peace. Then he retired. I'm winding up. Professor Kanyamba, when he retired, he taught me one thing, and the word is called humility. I'm very humble myself. But he added on my dose of humility. For a person who has a practice, applied the law at that level, to come and start practicing law even at the lowest level, respecting the decorum of even a chief magistrate, of even a magistrate grant, grade one, how much more humility could one person possess that can inspire the rest of us? But there's another side to it. If you have been comfortable, if you had had mansions in Kampala, 10, 20, 50, probably you would not have gone back to practice law. Would have been enjoying rent, from his, uh, rent money from his properties and other businesses. Probably the need to go and practice the law would have been less. But he didn't have. He lived to the true creed of service to people, not to self. And that's what makes Professor Kanyamba a very distinguished human being. And I had to find all ways possible to come here today. I had difficulties in the morning. And where I'm coming from, I had a meeting that, thank God, did not go way back, way into the afternoon. I would have sent my apologies, but then I was able to come. Humility. And then one time, he had been, he taught the trainees at uh, Kabaria Police Training School. So at the passing out of those uh, officers, he was invited. I would also participated in it, so I Traveling with Dr. Pio Lawyer, the columnist in the New Vision, is right. He's come every Wednesday. So we met at Masindi Hotel, and he told me this: Olanya, I didn't know you know so much law. I was talking about, but coming from him. In that way, I felt humble because it was the greatest, the greatest pronouncement of the class of law I know coming from a professor, Kanye Hamba. So from that moment, I said, hey, this man is you know, in, in his own way actually saying he respects me. I didn't know you know so much law. I don't know whether the professor remembers this. 
but it was very humbling for me. It inspired me to do more and do better and be level-headed and help people understand whatever is before them. National interest, service delivery to the people of this country. That's what we should stand for. I want to thank you for this opportunity. Professor, congratulations upon this. It's just another milestone. I'm sure there are several waiting and I'll be delighted, delighted to be part of the next ones. And I'll be glad if you invited me to enjoy with you. God bless. launch of the book I request that our chief guest uh, joins professor in that corner straight to our last item on the program which is a vote of thanks from the Honorable Amanya Mushega. Kindly take the mic from sir. Kanihamba, our guest speaker in his absence, Professor Mumba, ladies and gentlemen. First, Professor, I thank you for inviting me, not to this occasion, but move a vote of thanks. When you asked me to do so, it looked a Hadurian task, something on right. But when you told me that Rumombo was the one going to be the chief speaker in this panel of gurus, I got a little bit frightened. But I'll try. But before I come, to, and I was wondering whether I'm to thank for the book or thank you or the panelists, but before I come to you, permit me to be in order of merit. And mention about something about Professor Mumba and the panelists, and then move on to you and then conclude. Professor Mumba, about seven years ago, in Uzumba, when he had come to talk to the youth about not losing hope in the situation that was spreading in the Burundi then, I was then privileged to be among the fan of eminent persons bring some money in Burundi, including people like the former Prime Minister of Tanzania and the former PS of Kenya, Kipragat, Warioba. 
and he gave a lot of hope to the young Burundians. And I've been meeting him on many fora and on phone. But I wanted to thank him for one major event. I was tipped that the last night that he was on the front line with the deputy speaker, I think the moderator, the permanent member Mao, and Ofonopondo. The only thing I want to thank him for is that he raised the level of a debate to a level I've not seen before. Last night. Those who watched, people discussed issues, they were calm, they were not inter interjecting each other, shouting at each other, and I hope Mao and your friends, I hope now that you have gone that standard again. You don't become like what late President Moore used to say, that some of the leaders in Kenya are like pigs, that you wash them, when you reach them, they go back to the mud. I hope let's keep on, the, on the clean ground and really the level of the better last night, those who watched, were on issue of issues. And I saw Rania really pointing out the errors of issues in the parliament. And I hope that when he eventually gets what he wants, we will look forward to that the, the situation will be better. Not a parliament of two of trips and favors, but a parliament that is discussed is national issues and national interest. And let me point out one small thing. Pro politics is not a profession like being a lawyer, being a, a doctor, being what not. It is something you do for a while and go to do other things. But it's people, that's why people get stuck there. I see if I visit a medical service or legal firm. Politics is not a permanent employment. It's not a profession. It's not an occupation. Actually, when I'm feeding my form, I no longer put there that I'm a minister, so I put their farmer. I'm, I'm, and I'm enjoying my partners in retirement. If you are a, a mother, you take care of children. When your children get married and grow, you go back to singlehood. And when children come around, and in my case, then you have a new panel of eminent persons. I want to thank you, the panelists. And when my father in law, the right on was asking for an extension of time. I remember there was a debate in 2005 and 2004 as whether well we should extend time even so stick to them. So I said, yeah, this is very interesting. And uh, you got some extension, <laughs> which was not so limited. I thank you all. I can't mention each, I know each and everybody, and our colleague from Ghana, but the way you mentioned that when you were in Togo or Senegal, you seem to go over the place, but your message is clear, and you are proper above the water in the mouth. Fortunately, I was part of it before. I could be poisonous. That we take heed of that. And let, please, run for a while. And if you lose an election, whether you are an MP or you see one or running for primary, you find people killing each other for primaries. You wonder where, what they are seeing that I never saw for 15 years. I was a member of parliament for 15 years and a member for 15 years. But I don't see what is there that I sell my property, I kill my brother and jump the fences to get there. Maybe I should find out. It's not too late. I first listened to Professor Kanyahamba in 1967 when I was an S5 student and in my school there was a habit of inviting eminent person, the Mazuruis, the Rechons, medical superintendent to come and talk us on every Wednesday during the term time. And George Kanyahamba came over, I was a young lawyer, second, 67, I was in senior five. And uh, he was trying to inspire us to be lawyers, among other things. That was my first time to listen to him. I don't know whether I talked to him, but I did listen to him. The second time I visited him in full force, this was 1978. 
when I was a, a student, a PhD student at the University of London, and don't ask me why I'm not called doctor, please don't try. That is a question for my grandchildren, not for you. You have better things to do. I would drove from London to Cardiff. He was a university lecturer, and he gave us lunch with my other colleague. Then we advised that Professor Kanyihamba is a Muzungu, that if he invites you to lunch with your wife, you don't come with a third party. <laughs> Fortunately, I was a bachelor, and my host was a driver, so we, we had a good time with George. And I, again, I, as a student, for many years, we met in London as a leader of human rights group, and uh, people fighting against me at that time, and I enjoyed his uh, conversation and assistance. Subsequently, we are in government. In my language, they say when darkness eventually follows, eventually the, the child begins to bed with the mother's equals. So eventually I found him in the cabinet. But they are not listening to his point of view. The discussion will proceed beyond the cabinet hours. But more interestingly was when I met him in the golf club and my old friend and schoolmate then what is around. If you are going to pray for the normal four hours, seniors, and you are praying with the George, you have to put in an extra 30 or 40 minutes because the discussion along the game was quite extended and rich. And we miss you to that existence. But let me say this, what I picked from your book. Actually, it's really a book about the history and development of Uganda and where it is headed. There is very, very limited space about the constitution of Uganda. But I've seen a few interesting points of view there. One is the loss of the sense of shame among some of our leaders and by leaders, I, I am referring to leaders spiritual, leaders temporal, leaders entrepreneur, leaders inter, in, 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 entrepreneurial and intellectual, in, in their different capacities. A good example of people have, we have lost a sense of shame, you can do something, and so me, or Aibu Kwaxwai. And, and the person who proceeds, instead he blames you that you, why are you looking at me? Instead of saying, I'm sorry. I, I pick that one out through and through, and it's quite disturbing. The second observation, and that goes with the loss of values and the role and the play, the role of role models. Well, so when they used to bring these, uh, the Kuwait and Sobu Kanyamba talkers and in the school, the, the Bazoo, is they were to inspire you to see new thinkers from different fields. I don't know where our children get that sense of values and modeling from home as well as from other places. The second observation is the wondering of the role of law in our country. And my reading of it is that the, the lawyers who are here and those of you see things, that the problem I see in Uganda and in particular is not that our laws, that our laws are bad. It is that even those who make those laws, when they become inconvenient to them, they don't respect them and eventually they throw the way I behave as if they don't exist. And that is very, very serious. If you say, children go, we must all go to bed by nine and you, the father, you are still watching TV at 11. They dip in the window, those are the places, so they listen, choo, 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 choo. And tomorrow they lose, they lose respect. So we have, we have that problem of respecting and implementing laws only when they are suitable to us. That's why you find people driving over pavements. You go to Zambia. There was a road there, and they walk away for pedestrians. 
Now entrepreneurs have come and put furniture and all sorts of things right into the road. And the Americans have followed suit. Brought their wall from where it was, road verge, and put it in the middle of the road. And we trade without shame that if you are walking, look for your way. We want those who want to walk on the pavement think that you are safe. But that body will be on your back. And you find the vehicles, if we have, if the sense of peace and security has gone up, why are these vehicles riding over us all over the place? And why don't we choose to leave early? I'm talking to those who are near here to tell others. So that you avoid the crash hours. And they hoot as if you have no right to be on the road. So these are the little problems that can number one is about in the book. Ladies and gentlemen, I was once the leader of uh, the chief executive of East African community. And the issue of sovereignty, the sovereign, we are sovereign. When do we use the word sovereign? When we are doing well or when we are doing badly? When we are being praised, we are not sovereign, we will come with everybody. When they say, Mr. Mishaga, it is time to some sovereign state. So what is sovereignty? I will not see Biden saying, I'm a president of a sovereign state, America will do the following. And so you can say, really, a lion does not sing its, a tiger does not sing its stubbornness. When somebody says, I'm a tiger, just walk on. So is that problem. We don't have anything called sovereignty. Actually, the bigger we are together, the easier for the sovereign thing to be in place. I was reading his book. Excellence was a word for governors. The term describing governors. You saw African leaders who are called excellencies. Have you seen an American or Putin, his excellency Putin? The titles have become a problem and rights. Even, you, even if you did nothing, you get a medal and you wear it as if the world has come to an end. And I've always wondered, anybody wearing the color from hell to tail, yellow or pink or purple, I saw Jenny Mutu and I watch which colors are there now, or blue, you know there is a problem. If you have your wife, you go kissing all over the place in, in washrooms, in the kitchen, to show that you are special when they are visitors. So there is a problem of entitlement, the problem of recognition, the problem of one time I was at a meeting and this lady introduced to myself. I'm already was one, so I stood for parliament and lost. In the case we in doubt, she was she stood on an opposition ticket. So members of the movement be at peace. George, you have done your part. For the pleasure of my sister, Mrs. Matembe, the husband was my oldest classmate. We were together in kindergarten. Our children were writing on Sam today and we were still alive. I was reading the story of Jesus, not as a follower, but as one of the writings about the talent, the talents in the Bible. And when I was trying to say something about George, I said, what did it mean by the talent? God gave us the brain. Give us eyes, everybody. Give us the fingers and hands, the feet. All organs of the black, yellow, pink are exactly the same. The Zomu Zungo Russian with 15 fingers. So if we are to go to heaven tomorrow, I'm, I'm not anxious. And we are asked, what did you do with the talent the talents I gave you, you Africans? When we are raising money for this thing, Corona, the following day, we are increasing parliament and creating cities. Now you have no money to so send your children to school, and now you are marrying a second wife and paying the dowry. Isn't it, is it, is it this amazing? So how are you using the resources, my speaker? By the way, I enjoyed your debate last night. I've been calling you, but you don't know my number. You fear that at least maybe people trying to support the other candidate. Now, please give him my number so that tomorrow he receives it. 
But there is that big problem. What? How are we using our resources for the future of our children? Why are we specialists? In 1860, you could not have believed a minister killing a person, you would have left your seat immediately. Ajian actually did. Ajian did. He was from Westland. He was a minister, he was assistant minister. That he killed a person on the road. There was no question. But now you can slap as many as you want. So, finally, please, as George points out, let us one value ourselves, let's value each other, beating the Ugandan, kicking Ugandan, calling him a dog is not complimentary. I would rather be abused than abuse myself. I would rather be called a fool by somebody else than to convince myself that I'm a fool. So let's give ourselves pride. So you have used your Taranta, the intellectual who are writing books and the ones you have asked us to launch today. So you are account properly. You are building a good role model and you have really put a legacy by putting your ideas down on the paper and for us to read now and in the future. I thank you for inviting me to this occasion. I think I thank you for the honor to move a pot of thanks, whatever it means. I, have, I hope I've thanked you. And if I'm not, at least I've done what I have to do. And you can clap me for that one also. Thank you.